we had been teaching cooking classes at Red Stick Spice Company. You know, I had this spice company. I was talking to home cooks every day, you know, cooking at home from whole ingredients. I've said it so many times. Was teaching these cooking classes, and I really wanted people to walk away having learned something, and they were. But I, I just felt like it wasn't as robust of an experience as it could have been. And one day we decided to switch up the way we teach cooking classes. And we had a point in the cooking class where we stopped the cooking action and we seated everyone and we all ate together. And it was like light bulbs went off everywhere above my head, above staff's head. We got so much more feedback from customers after we started doing that, it just became this thing that we do all the time now. And it's so simple. We know this. We know from our childhood memories, from memories of all the those meals where we sit together and we gather where all the magic happens. So I knew this. I knew this to exist in the world, but it took the cooking classes, watching these cooking classes unfold for it to go, oh, that's what we do. And now it's a non-negotiable. We all sit together and eat at the end of class. Now, this is the thing, this gathering, this this reason to gather is what my entire business rotates around. Everything we do, every subscription box we pack, every recipe we write, every customer interaction is all around Will you take this, make a meal at home, and share it with someone else? It just has now become, gathering has now become the reason for everything that we do. Today's episode, we have Leslie Todd on the show. She's a licensed clinical social worker. I'm happy to call her my friend. And she enjoyed a class with us and said something to me at the end of that class that was so powerful to me that what I was doing was so important for a lot of folks' mental health. And I just wanted to dive in with her about that and um, get her take on what that can do for someone to have that sort of experiential learning, that sort of communal learning slash fun, two hours, what that means for someone in their life. I love dishes that are different and everyone sort of gathers around and lose their manners a little bit. You know, everybody's digging in at once. We put this dish together that Sarah and I cooked together at the end. of um, It's all of these ingredients come together that seem like, how is this this fun appetizer? But it's this roasted cauliflower dish. It's got a walnut caper salsa on top. We put it over lemony yogurt and you bake up some warm naan. And it's just like the conversation starts around this dish. I just, to me, it's just so speaks to having friends over, pouring a couple of glasses of wine and digging into this dish. This is our final episode of season one, and I can't think of a better way to end the season around the very thing that means the most to us in the store. And that I think should be the end goal to to your cooking is making sure you're sitting down and enjoying it with other folks. So I love that Leslie was with me on this final episode, and I cannot wait till season two. My name is Ann Milnick. I call myself the tireless champion of home cooks, and this is Smidgen. You're listening to Smidgen, the Red Stick Spice Company podcast located directly between a dash and a pinch, where it's all about the tips, tricks, and tools to make home cooking easy and doable. We did our research, and it's proven. Mealtime's where it's at. And now your host, Ann Milnick. We are here with Leslie Todd, licensed clinical social worker. She's been a social worker in Baton Rouge for 29 years. Her practice, Strategies for Change, is devoted to helping adults and their complicated families. She trains other professionals in step family, divorce, and family court issues, and offers workshops on family issues for the public. More about Leslie can be found at leslietodd.com, and we'll talk about all of that in show notes so that everyone has an opportunity to find you. But Leslie, thank you so much for coming on Smidgen. It's I really my appreciate it. pleasure to be here. I, I want to tell folks about how we met because there's a little more to that story, I think, than you know. So you were in one of my cooking classes. You were actually in a cooking demo. We call those sit, watch, and eat demos. And that's where you sit, you enjoy a glass of wine if you'd like, and we do all the cooking and we're talking and we're demonstrating and we're educating and cooking all at once and then serving you 
a meal. So there's a lot of eyes on me. I was in, very talented in those. Yes. Oh, <laughs> so what you don't know is that I have dealt with issues with public speaking. What I've found out as I dove into it is that I actually don't have an issue with public speaking. I have an issue with all the thoughts around what everyone's face looks like while I'm speaking. You know, this sort of aftermath, I go into a little bit of self-loathing and wondering what were they thinking. And I really wanted to tackle it. And so I took a deep dive into self-help. I bought them all. <laughs> like I started mainlining mm -hmm. self-help and reading everything I could get to listening to everything. And I learned a lot and they teach a lot of similar things. But then there are times when it's like Brene Brown's telling me, feel your feelings. And then another person saying, you can't feel your feelings, just action, make some space between your feelings and do something. And I was getting sort of confused. And then I would have these YouTube binges of Tony Robbins. And then I wanted to go whiten my teeth because <laughs> his did. teeth are just fabulous. And so I was like, you know, this is a lot of information. And so I hired someone to help me call all that information. And she taught me a great trick. So that trick is to really start to single out the people in the room that I'm most concerned about, the ones that I'm reading their face going, they don't like me, they think I'm terrible. And after that cooking demo, I go to that person, introduce myself, and so far, 100% of the time, they're a lovely person who says, I really enjoyed it. And they just don't make the most pleasant face while that I'm talking. That must have been me. <laughs> so I approached you. And to my surprise, you are a mental health professional. And you were delighted to be there. And I want to talk about what happened in that class and what you and I talked about afterwards. But I do want to ask you about in my world, in the cooking world, there's a lot of information out there. And I find customers come in, they're overwhelmed, and they're intimidated. I wonder if what I experienced with all that self-help, I was just buying book after book after book and reading and listening. I wonder if you experienced something similar with your clients in terms of there's so much information out there that either they're confused or just don't know what to do. Right. And also, I have a background as an English teacher. I have a master's in English as well, so I'm quite the reader. Okay. And I had to learn that not everybody else is quite the reader. Mm -hmm. And I also had to learn that instead of recommending a whole slew of books, now I just send people out and say, look, here's this topic you might be interested in. Why don't you kind of look around for one in this area? And I tell them, it's kind of like buying a dress. Mm -hmm. you, know, you should look through them yourself and see what appeals to you. So I've pretty much narrowed it down that way. Mm -hmm. Because if I give someone a list of 10 books, like, here's some really good books, you know, that overwhelms them. Less this broad subject of self-help, help, but more calling it down to the specific, like for me, with this post-event. What do they think about Yeah, me? stress and mm -hmm. this chatter in my head about, I shouldn't have said that and I should have said this differently. When in the end, it was just fine. And again, because I didn't know this story, so I was probably concentrating trying to learn stuff and watch stuff. And so then I have my serious scholar face on. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I enjoyed every minute of it. Well, good. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what you experienced in that class is actually not how it started out when we started teaching cooking classes two and a half years ago. We were teaching cooking classes. I'm a chef. I have lots to offer in terms of food knowledge. And I'm all the women in my family are educators. And so they were very, very scholarly. And you learned a lot that was jam-packed with information and you learned and then we dropped the mic and the class was over and we sent you on your way. And so a colleague of mine, Tracy Vincent, who's a chef as well, she was teaching with me one night and we got done and she sort of wiped her brow and said, wow, that was like culinary school. Hmm. And I thought, well, well, that's not what we're doing here. Hmm. You know, a retail store, this is supposed to be fun. So we changed up the way we do it. Now every class, sit, watch, and eat demos are very much like a dinner party. Mm -hmm. Even hands-on classes, there's a point when we stop the instruction, we reconfigure the room, we all sit and we enjoy the meal together. And from a business perspective, it was a really smart thing to do mm -hmm. because I showed gains when we started doing that. But just from a human perspective, I'm looking out at this room of mostly 
strangers who didn't know each other in the beginning, and they're taking selfies <laughs> at the end of the class, mm -hmm. and they're all really enjoying themselves. And there's no mistaking that everyone's having a great time. Right. So I'm curious about this gathering. What's going on in the brain? What are all the good things that are happening when that gathering is taking place? Well, your gathering is not quite a social gathering, okay? Your gathering has a purpose. So it's a self-selected audience mm -hmm. in that regard. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit different than your basic dinner party. But in that case, people all chose to come because they wanted to learn something. And I remember that class was the one about sauces. Yes. Getting yes. sauced. And so people come in and some of us might have been a little nervous because we're not great cooks. Other people already know this stuff. Okay. So you have different levels of people's knowledge. And so maybe they have different levels of anxiety. But most of them picked it, I'm sure, because it was, looked like a fun way to learn. So you got the fun part. And you certainly set it up. That was a beautiful surrounding, very nice folks. Who was your helper that day, the sous chef? Lily. She's great. Yeah. Okay, that was really fun. Very attractive setup. And then you have the television screen, too, so you can actually look down into the pans when you're cooking. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. And then, of course, you have people sitting next to you who you may or may not know. Some people came in in a group. It was my husband and me without any other group. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could see there were oh, like uh, duets and there were four people together and such. And you had a nice age range. So it encourages people to talk to each other. So then the socializing begins. And because of it set up in courses, kind of the way it was, there was interludes in there where we could talk. But other times we're not going to talk because we're watching you, mm -hmm. which makes it a little different than the dinner party scene, right? Okay. So you do a really good job of having the didactic part and then the visual part and then the conversational part. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there was the food part. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty great. So... It's interesting you say that because Catherine, my producer, and I were just talking about this before you got here. I feel like we are in a place, or at least this is what my Facebook feed is telling me, is that a lot of us n seem to know a lot about our personality types, whether it's Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. A lot of people mm -hmm. talking about what type they are. So I'm curious, I've been told I'm an introvert and have these other parts of me, and I hear that a lot from other folks. What would you say to, say, the introvert in terms of getting out there and enjoying what you just described in the class? What would be some tips for, okay, well, for them? introverts, and you probably are an introvert. I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. And yet you and I both do public speaking. Yes. Right? People think I'm an extrovert, but I'm an introvert. So introverts are really quite gabby when they're on a topic that they are comfortable with. What they're not good at is just starting up from nothing in a public setting. Okay. Maybe that had something to do with my face. Small talk. <laughs> small talk. Yeah. No, terrible. Okay. Not good at small talk. But when they are settled mm -hmm. about the topic, they can go on. My husband's a great example. He doesn't talk much except when he's on certain subjects like music. People go, my God, he knows so much. Yeah, he really does. Mm -hmm. But he will listen. And introverts are excellent listeners. They really are interested in other people. And so they're quite comfortable doing the listening. And, of course, an extrovert loves to be listened to. So that's kind of a matchup where if you have an introvert and an extrovert, the introvert's going to be talking because that's their comfort level. Mm -hmm. And the introvert's going to be listening because that's their comfort level. Okay. And here's my best example. Two very famous talk show hosts, Jay Leno and David Letterman. Jay Leno, extrovert. David Letterman, Introvert. You can just tell, although they're both comedians, by their style. Okay, and this is an old school example, I know. But Letterman was in his head, and he amused himself with what was going on in his head. Mm -hmm. Jay Leno is interacting with the crowd more, right? Right. So, so. that's interesting, because a lot of times I crack myself up. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> Introverts are hilarious. <laughs> because of what's going on in my head. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there's also a component to this about the term I keep coming up with is experiential learning, mm -hmm. that coming to a class to learn something, but it's still sort of a fun social setting. What's happening there? I see it with both individuals, but also companies sometimes hire me to do cooking classes right. as team building or an out. I'm Monday, I'm doing a dentist office. It's just their monthly outing to come take That's a cooking cool. class. What's different? for the individual versus when that is a 
required group outing. Part of that would be introversion, extroversion, but really we have different learning styles. Mm -hmm. This is where my teaching background comes in handy, okay? Some people are auditory learners. Okay. Some people are visual learners. So people who are watching you cook Mm -hmm. might really get it better by watching you cook. And then other people are what we call sensory perceptives. And so they learn by doing. Mm -hmm. So they want to be in that kitchen learning stuff. Okay. By the way, you know the people who watch cooking shows? Yes. They generally don't cook. They they watch Correct. the shows. <laughs> Correct. So that's like it goes into a different part of their brain. Yeah. And that's true with all the YouTube stuff. People watch stuff and think they're gaining mastery. In fact, they're not gaining mastery. Mm-hmm. They need to do it. Okay. So you provide a service that's really important. You teach people how to do it. So is that then helpful to that group when they go back to do their other work that's not food related? If Well, if they have spent time with you, it's also locked it in their brains in another way because it's way more intimate. Okay, if I watch some cooking show, Mm -hmm. it's a false intimacy. There's nothing really there. But you, you're moving around. Mm -hmm. And we're mammals. You know, like when we're in space together, we actually kind of connect to each other. Mm -hmm. So they watch you and they can ask a question in real time right there. Mm -hmm. They could take notes if they want to. And then they can go back and learn. And then they can come back to you. So it's not like it just has to be a one shot. For instance, this dentist thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe two out of the, I don't know how many people were there. Let's just say two of them say, that was really cool. Let's do it again. Mm -hmm. And they may deepen their learning by coming back. Ah, okay. So you're giving them a one-shot introduction the first time. Yeah. And you don't know, in that class, there might be some fabulous cooks already. There might be people who've never, ever cooked anything. Mm -hmm. You can't control for that. But the fact that you're there and the warm and fun person you are makes it a really good experience for them if it's their very first time. So I want to go back to introverts and get your thoughts on isolation and if that's anything connected to personality types or if that's sort of universal. This morning alone, here's an example. I exercised with an app, an app that delivers a new customized workout to me. So rather than going to a gym, I exercise alone with an app. Now, It's also a great solution for me because my schedule Mm -hmm. is so hectic. I also ordered groceries from a delivery service, so I didn't go to a grocery store. I don't know that grocery stores are that intimate of a social connection, but I also banked online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have not set foot in a bank in a very long time. I remember my mother getting dressed up to go to the bank, and it was easily a twice a week. And the tellers wore suits. Yes, And I love technology and I love connectivity, but I looked at just this morning how I was able to do things that were sound kind of isolating, Mm -hmm. that were formally social. Do you see this in your practice or what you're studying as an issue? It's a big mental health issue. The internet is perfect for introverts. It was created by introverts. Mm -hmm. The tech folks are generally introverts, okay? And tech folks are also thinkers more than feelers, if we want to go into our Myers-Briggs-y kinds of stuff, Mm -hmm. okay? It's a perfect medium for them, but it is not an excellent medium for us as human beings because we do need connection. You know, I referred earlier to us being mammals. We do need social connection. Our brains are wired with mirror neurons so that we pick up from each other facial expressions, tones of voice, body language, et cetera. So we really need that. And we are seeing a terrible decrease in the quality of relationships in Mm -hmm. people. And when they eat, it makes me sad if I go to a restaurant and people are on their phones and they're not looking at each other. Right. And you know that's happening around dinner tables if they're even eating at dinner tables. Sure. One of the very first things when I look at a family is to check on how much social interaction they actually have with each other. And so the, one of the finest ways to do that is a meal, just even one meal a day, mm-hmm. or if it has to be one meal a week. But people are so fragmented and running around, and they're slaves to their devices. Right. In fact, I do a workshop called Left to Their Own Devices because mm-hmm. I see so much addiction. For someone who is, I work very hard to find how I can tap and swipe my way right. to the easiest solution What do you see as a long-term effect of that? What's being diagnosed? And think about kids who are gamers. Okay. And not all kids have a gaming addiction. But if you have an adolescent kid who is 
more and more spending time online, that child is not having social interactions and they are not developing social competencies because Mm -hmm. they're playing. Now, the competency that they are developing is a gaming competency. It's very narrow, right? Mm -hmm. But they might be thinking they're having a social relationship with people all over the world that they're playing with to slay dragons or gain treasure or whatever they're doing. And so it's a false sense of a society. It's a false sense of social relationships. Meanwhile, they're sitting still. These kids are getting hernias. <laughs> they're, get, they're getting malnutrition. I mean, because mm-hmm. the super addict ones are really in poor health as well. And then because they're further and further behind in their social development, they avoid it more. We avoid what we're not good at. One of the things I always have to check with as parents are how aware are you of how much time your kids are spending on a device? And when you talk to those families, and there is definitely a lack of gathering, how do you encourage them to do that? What well, do... I have to get them off their own devices first. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to your thing about you're comfortable at home doing these things. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that's fine mm-hmm. because you also extrovert. You mm-hmm. know, you do have other ways to be connected. I'm an introvert too. So I had breakfast by myself. I went to the gym by myself. I don't talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I listen to an audio book. But then I make dates to see people for things. Okay. Being an introvert, I like one-on-ones. So, you okay. know, I have lunch or dinner with a friend, go to a movie, something like that. And I do parties too, but you know, I'm not going to be out at some big social gathering with a lot of strangers mm-hmm. very often. So I just create that time. And also, if you have a special interest, you probably have lots of friends in the cooking world. Sure. I have lots of friends in various things that I do, art or running or other things that I like to do. So joining a group or going to an art class or something like right. that. Right. And would in- be... introverts are good at that because, remember, they like their special interests. They tend to dive deep into something. Mm-hmm. Notice what you did when you decided you wanted to know about social anxiety. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you had to read everything about it. Right. So an, an extrovert Amazon would, thanked me. Yeah. And <laughs> an extrovert would turn to their friend and go, what do you think about social anxiety? <laughs> right. <laughs> So I want to go back to the families and gathering and home cooking because I am a big fan of Mark Bittman and Michael Pollan, who are the food visionaries out there who talk a lot about the importance of home cooking, beautiful books that they've published, lovely Netflix series that are out there. And then recently, another book came across my monitor there called Pressure Cooker, And it was sort of a rebuttal to what they're saying, because there's a little bit of the talk about what they are proposing as a very Norman Rockwell Mm -hmm. romantic vision of what home cooking should be, and that there's a little bit of judginess there. And Pressure Cooker points out how hard it is for families to cook and eat together These are anthropologists who did these studies just to point out that there are obstacles to doing that. And I've sort of thought about changing my stance on, I do want everyone to cook at home, but I also want folks to know that you can also bond with your family over a meal of Chick-fil-A. Absolutely. It'll be just fine. I wouldn't want it to come off that there was any intimidation or high pressure expectations of what gathering can look like. So I'd love for you to talk about how simple that can look. It doesn't have to be a elaborate home-cooked meal. Michael Pollan took a year to put together one meal. Do you remember the book? Yes. Which I love, The Omnivores Dilemma. So yeah, and I love him. I think he's fabulous. However, I agree. And it's interesting because right now I'm watching my daughter and her husband, who are now 38 and just had their first child 10 months ago. And they're both really hardworking career people in Dallas. I think Becca's cooked one meal that I've been at in all the times I've visited. And it certainly hasn't been since that baby's come. These are modern family kind of issues, but they eat well. When you have really good stores around, and not everybody does, we have to worry about food deserts and compromised food. But to get things that are already prepared and the choices that you have to pick the healthier ones is awesome. And just the fact that you're sitting with your family eating that's where the bonding is, to sit around doing a common activity. And the common activity can't be being on your cell phones. The common activity could be playing a game as well as eating a meal. So it's the shared activity, a pleasurable shared activity is where the bonding takes place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, men, they don't usually go out and say, let's talk. 
They go right. do something, mm -hmm. right? They like to do stuff. And so it's that same thing, that if we do something together, we have a more pleasant feeling. And that's how strangers bond, too. I always tell my introvert clients, go take a class or join a club, take an ollie class or take a dance class or do something, because you get to focus on doing the thing, mm -hmm. but you'll be around other people, and that will just kind of spark some conversation. Mm -hmm. But food is one of the great gathering centers in all civilization. Right. And you and I spoke a little bit before we started about the blue zones. And mm -hmm. I love reading about the blue zones. These are the pockets of civilization all over the world that these are the places where there are the most centenarians, most folks mm -hmm. who live to 100. And they are really diverse. It's everything from a largely plant-based community in Okinawa to Sardinia, Italy, that they drink wine every day. And then Loma Linda, where the Seventh-day Adventists are, who are abstinent from alcohol and very strong religious community. So a lot of their habits don't look the same, but the one common denominator among all of these little pockets is they gather community in some yeah. way every day. That's one of the things we know about longevity mm -hmm. is having a sense of community and social ties is the most important thing. You don't even have to have good health as long as you have community. Mm -hmm. And that's why, well, one of the reasons women tend to live longer than men is because we tend to tend a social network. Men often rely on their women to create the social network for them. And that's not always true, but it's just kind of a cultural tendency. Some men, more extroverted men, might have their own pack of friends. But a lot of men kind of rely on their wife to keep the family connections going and to keep the friendships going, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's more likely for men to get depressed in older age if they haven't kept up this social connection. Mm -hmm. And men who are widowed, who haven't kept it up, are likely to die within two years of being widowed. Whereas women tend to get a second wind. Of course, they grieve their husband, but because they've had this other network all along. And I like to say, when men need comforting, who do they go to? A woman. When women need comforting, who do they go to? A woman. A woman. <laughs> sort of off topic, but I'm so curious. I feel like there are assisted living community centers. I feel like they're being built everywhere. Well, it's the population lump of the older folks in the baby boom generation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they are. That brings me up to Meals on Wheels. You know, one of the great things about Meals on Wheels is it's human contact. They're not just bringing food to the person who's at home alone. They're bringing a face Someone say, Miss Jones, how are you doing today? Right, right. And that's huge. So Meals on Wheels, church suppers, anything that helps people get together over food. And food, let's just talk about the psychology of food for a minute. Okay. Okay. Food is mother. Food is always mother. It's the deepest roots we have, no pun intended, into our existence. We must be fed. Oh, my gosh. We must be fed. And so you can imagine I had a lot of clients who had eating disorders or other kind of food issues. And I have to go back to mother kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I've had people who I've helped with an eating disorder by asking them to just go find some raw food. I've had people who didn't know what food looks like, like they couldn't tell a cabbage from a mm -hmm. cauliflower. People who are really kind of food ignorant. I don't mean that in a judgy, but they, they just had no knowledge of food. Yeah. You know, they always ate prepared food. Mm -hmm. So I do remember one client I had who was completely dissociated. And I told her to go to the store and go find carrots and go eat some carrots. Mm -hmm. and then I had her go to a community garden and pull the carrot out of the ground. And when she ate that, she cleaned it off and ate it. She said it was the best thing she ever had. And it changed her because she made the connection between being on the earth, being planted on the earth, because we have to have that connection to the earth. And so food has a real sacred and a real social connection for us. Think of all the super duper important art or mythological or religious connotations of food. Right. And I hear so many folks talk about their strongest childhood memories are oftentimes associated with a meal or a holiday, but they often talk about the food. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. When we talk about gathering and what happens with gathering is the natural opposite of that, or is it too far of a leap to say that is the exact opposite of that loneliness? 
You can be alone and not lonely, but being isolated would probably lead to loneliness. Okay. Right? You can be an introvert and just see people at a certain pace, you know, have a couple dates a week to go see people. That's fine. But depressed people don't do that. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking mental illness, which is a different subject. Okay. Introversion and extroversion is just how your energy is wired. Okay. Kind of like being an innie or an outie, mm -hmm. right? Your energy is either innie or outie. Mental illness is another thing. And the real problem with depression and anxiety is it makes us isolate. For instance, if you got all caught in your head about, I can't be around people because I don't know how they're going to look at me, mm -hmm. you could isolate. That would be from anxiety. Other people who are depressed don't have the energy to get out there. What's the use? Life sucks. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They get more and more isolated. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to help them break that. And then there's, of course, the stigma if they're thinking, I have a mental illness. Really, one of the great ways to break it is to get them out with other people. And that's one of the reasons I'm sorry that people don't do group therapy anymore. You know, it's very hard to get people out to do anything. It's kind of just a sitcom joke, isn't it? It's a sitcom joke, and yet it's a very useful thing. And I'm really sorry we don't have that. And I'm sorry that people don't go out to classes. I'm sorry that professionals, this <laughs> is a current thing for me, I teach professional classes for other professionals. But now they can get a lot of their continuing education credits online, watching webinars. There you and go. I'm sorry. I'm old school. Mm -hmm. It's like, eh, no, you really can't learn how to do this technique or really learn the finesse of it mm -hmm. on a webinar. And you're sure not going to read it, you know, and get it. You have to be with people and practicing. It's with cooking and it's also with therapy. It's mm -hmm. anything you need to learn. You need a mentor and you need hands-on. Mm -hmm. And practice. And practice, yeah. right. With a mentor who says, that was awesome, or, well, why don't you tweak it a little this way or that? It could be salt, or mm -hmm. it could be therapy. I love that. I read recently that the Prime Minister of England appointed a Ministry of Loneliness, and it sounds a little oh. bit like a Monty Python it episode, <laughs> the Ministry of Loneliness, <laughs> but they identified it as such a problem there, a little bit to do with the way they designed their communities, that just the way the neighborhoods are set up, there's such a lean toward isolation and they're starting to build in little pocket parks. And that's good if people will get off their phones, <laughs> right? I mean, we can provide that and that's awesome, but we all have this individual responsibility to pry our heads off of that. They are addictive, okay? Mm -hmm. You have a casino in your pocket. I mean, it beeps and it pings and it does things to get your attention. And now you think every time it beeps or pings, you have to look at it right now because it might be important. And you know, 85% of it's not important. And the other thing is we don't communicate even voice to voice anymore. Try to get someone to pick up a telephone, right? And so people will text. And I have personally been on a binge this last week of I'm just tired of texting, and I'm tired of emailing. I want to talk to a person, and I have to write a three-page text, and my thumbs hurt instead right. of picking up the phone and saying, hey, how are you doing? Yeah. 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 Like, I want to ask someone to have lunch with me. So we're missing that, and mm -hmm. it's a big loss, and we're not going to do well as humans if we don't turn that one around. Well, this has been fascinating. I have loved this conversation. I just want to ask you one more question. For that person who is really struggling with getting out there, it's sort of that thing in the back of their mind, like this may be a problem. What's one small thing they can do today to help get them to that place where they can get more social connection in? If they have anyone that they trust just to say, I'm having a hard time. I'm having a hard time. And of course, I hope that people who hear that know what to do, which mm -hmm. is not to give them advice and say, come on out, do this, da, da. just listen and say, that must be really hard for you. Right. Is there any way I can help rather than give an advice? Because mm -hmm. that just mostly shuts people down. Mm -hmm. The way you might do it may not be the way they need to do it. And of course, they could see a therapist to get some help with it. Sure. But certainly any loved person, mm -hmm. you know, anyone that, who's in their family or a trusted friend, or it could be a pastor, you know, or, or some trusted figure like that, just to let them know that I'm having a hard time with it. The ones I really worry about are the ones who don't understand they're having a hard time with this. Mm. 
And in terms of if you do get that call or that person does reach out to you, what you say, I love that you said that because when I was sharing with folks about my spin out and all that chatter, every time I had to do some public speaking, I got a lot of, oh, you did fine. It's just fine. And I'm in my brain going, it's actually not. You right. know, I feel really rotten right now. The way you receive that information from someone, I think, is really, really important. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I have loved this. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is my happy face, you see. I like you. I love that happy face. So thank you so much, <laughs> Leslie. This has been a treat. So we want folks to think back to what Leslie said about reaching out to someone, a mentor, a loved one, someone they trust, if feelings of loneliness or isolation are causing concern. You can also reach out on a website that I use called Psychology Today. You put in your criteria, your zip code, and it connects you with mental health professionals in your area, and you can dig really deep and find ones that specialize in your particular issues. We just want to make sure that folks reach out, ask for help if those sorts of feelings are of concern to them. Big thanks to Leslie Todd. I love that I got to wrap up this season with her. She's such a great person, and I hope everyone found some information that they can take away. So we are heading to the Red Stick Spice Test Kitchen. We're going to make that roasted cauliflower with walnut caper salsa and that lemony yogurt with Sarah, and you are not going to be able to resist digging in. All right, we are back. You're listening to Smidgen, and this is our cooking segment of this fun little podcast. You're in the cooking classroom of Red. We're in the cooking classroom of Red Stick Spice Company. I'm here with Sarah again. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> She's always game to come help me out with projects like this. So yes. this is really fun. So we just got done talking to Leslie Todd, and she and I met at a cooking class here at Red Stick Spice. And she gave me just one of the biggest compliments I think of my career. She said, "What the space we've created here." is so important to folks to um, get involved with some experiential learning at, where there's not a lot of pressure, like nobody's right. going to have a test, mm -hmm. it's not chopped, um, and get to know other people and get out and how important that is to mental health. So she and I took a really deep dive into um, cooking for others, cooking at home, but then also entertaining and inviting folks over and a little bit of the angst that some folks experience with doing that. So. All of that to get to this dish, which is a great entertaining dish. Yes, that, I'm um, about it. And I know you've had it before because yeah. this was taught to me by my co instructor, Lily. Right. Um, this is a recipe that she adapted from the cookbook Jerusalem, oh. um, which is a beautiful, uh, not completely vegetarian, but definitely plant forward book mm -hmm. um, that makes use of all these really tangy, briny flavors that come from that part of the world. So, this is a roasted cauliflower that we're doing with a lemon yogurt sauce. And we're going to make what um, the cookbook author calls a salsa. Um, I look at it more as a vinaigrette, but we're going to put some really interesting flavors together that's going to go on top of this. So let's start roasting the cauliflower first. Okay. So you were talking earlier about, um, or maybe Kat, our producer Catherine was saying, don't cut the cauliflower, do the cauliflower when the camera's rolling because people need yes. to know this. Because, yeah, when we made the recipe, we did it as flor florets. Right. Um, but your recipe calls for it to be a cauliflower steak, which I don't know how to cut that. So yes. I wanted to watch you and kind of learn how to cut it as more of a steak. Yes. So the first thing I want to do is get these leaves off of here, or most of them. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go through and find the core and cut it away from the core. And I am going to cut it into steaks, but I am going to cut it from there into smaller pieces, smaller okay. steaks. But the whole point of cutting it into steaks is to make sure you have lots of flat sides mm -hmm. because it's the flat sides and the connection of the flat side with the hot surface of the pan that's going to get it to caramelize and you get all those beautiful brown crispies. Yeah. So I want to get in here and get this core out of here. So I'm going at an angle. There okay, it goes. There's so many great cauliflower recipes, but they're kind of difficult to yeah. cut and it and, can get a little messy. And lots of people buying bags of riced cauliflower mm -hmm. and um, tackling a cauliflower is not that difficult. So I just want to get that core out of here. And look, this core, a lot of people are um, using it now, which it's absolutely edible. You can totally get that, um, puree that into a soup for sure. Yeah. So um, yeah, 
does not necessarily have to be discarded. So, thank you. So I'm just gonna start by cutting this guy in half, and then half again, and then here's where these stakes come in. So I could have left that big and cut bigger stakes, right, but I actually half. want some smaller pieces. And so that guy's gonna go flat on our sheet pan, and you see all these little pieces that are falling away? You want all of that. Yeah. Because those are gonna get really crispy. Um, so but it's more of almost like a something, well, because we're going to be dipping it in the sauce, correct? Well, I lay mine like out like a, it's like a layered dip, and then I okay. serve it with naan, and then you get a big scoop of it and okay. put it on your naan. Um, but, so there's our steaks, and then let's get this one cut in half. So I've seen the cauliflower steaks where it looks like they cut the entire thing. Right. Um, and, but that's not as like, you know... You can't really eat that with your hands, and it's right. supposed to be, I think, more of a shareable dish. Correct. I want this to be something that's more scoopable and approachable right. when you walk up to this platter, where lots of folks are standing alongside you right. trying Just, to get some of that. Exactly. So let's get this on the sheet pan, and then we're going to season it. Let me push all of this on the sheet pan, and then you and I can arrange it. All right. So we definitely still want all those little bits. So let's... None of them overlapping, none of them on top of each other. And we're gonna season this with our Harissa olive oil and a blend called Zug. So this is a Yemeni blend, um, which I am absolutely definitely pronouncing incorrectly, <laughs> um, but a beautiful blend that's reminiscent of Zatar. Okay. Um, just big pieces of spices. And what's interesting to about this one is there's dried cilantro oh, in here, yeah. which is, you don't see that a ton right. in cooking, dried cilantro. Lots of fresh cilantro in right. the world, but not dried. Okay, so you're going to go generously all over this. This harissa olive oil has those lovely, sweet harissa spices along with chili. So you're, you're going to get cinnamon, allspice, nutmeg, coriander, things like that in this oil, along with just a little bit of heat. That is, is that gorgeous. Good? Yes. I love that color. Yeah. So Bright orange. We're going to season this pretty generously with... The zug, and then I'm going to grab it a spatula. So Doesn't it smell wonderful? Yeah. So what are you getting first? Because I immediately get coriander. I wasn't going to say that. Okay. But I don't, I, I'm trying to put my finger on it. I'm not as, as you know, my palate isn't as, um, you know, sophisticated as But it smells, <laughs> does it smell spicy or savory? Savory. Okay. I think. And maybe, but maybe it, it makes a little me think bit. of like Greek food when I smell it. Really Greek, yeah. Because I smell a little bit of a Mexican restaurant. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that's the coriander and a little bit of cumin in gotcha. there. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So get those moved all over, and then we're going in the oven with this, and we're going to roast these at a really high heat until they're very tender. We definitely want them uh, knife tender, where you can easily pierce it with a knife. But we also definitely want to see some good caramelization going right. on with these. So I'm going to scoot right here and get these in the oven. And then we are going to move on to create the salsa or vinaigrette okay. um, that goes on top. So what I'm going to have you do, I need the zest of an entire lemon. Okay. And then you're going to need the juice of this lemon. And it's going to be way easier to zest it before we cut it right, than exactly. afterwards. So have you ever zested a lemon? I would love to see how you do it, okay. just to make sure I'm doing it correctly. <laughs> so I hold the microplane, the zester, upside down with the fruit underneath it. So I do less of this mm -hmm. and more. See, where... that's why I wanted you to show me, because I would have done it the other way. <laughs> so you can totally do this, and you'll get there. Right. Um, where you move the fruit and you hold the zester still. But I do it the opposite because I don't want to grab the pith the white of the lemon that's underneath the zest because it's a little bitter. Mm -hmm. And so that way I can look each Let's time see. I pull the zester, I can look and make sure I haven't gone over a spot far, twice yeah. where you're definitely going into the pith. And I can also see the zest that's building up on the microplane. Like if I need a teaspoon, I can eyeball a teaspoon. Whereas if it were upside down, I would constantly be like tapping it off and trying to figure yeah. out what's going on. That makes sense. And um, this was a trick. Uh, um, fellow student taught me in culinary school. Okay. So I was, I went to culinary school late in life. I was 40. I was taught this by an 18 year old, which okay. fine with me. Great tip. But yeah. <laughs> um, but we do need the zest of that entire lemon. Okay. 
So while you do that, I'm going to start this very important step where capers get sizzled in some hot oil. Um, and they're going to bloom and they're going to brown and they're going to burst. Okay. And they're going to get a little bit crispy. That oil then becomes the oil of our vinaigrette, vinaigrette. or salsa, okay. whatever you want to call it. So I've got capers. And which oil do you use there. for that? How fun is that, that sound? Ooh. About a quarter cup. Okay. And they are definitely sizzling. Yes. Do you use the avocado oil? I did. I used pure okay. avocado oil. And so do you like capers? It depends. If it's if it's too much, um, I, I don't tend to like them. But I think when they're kind of blended in, like like they're going to be kind of in the salsa. I kind of if they're not the main event. Okay. If they're I'm just kind of there. in something, um, I don't notice them as much. Yeah. Because they're just I just tend tend to find they're very salty. Right. And um, I also like them when they're tamped down a little bit mm -hmm. in a dish that has a lot of fat. Right. So. Um, a chicken piccata that's uh, got that heavy cream and butter and all right, of that. Right, Those right. Capers in there, I, I really dig. But capers just thrown on top of a salad or something like that, I'm, I'm with yeah, you. It's, it's a, a little it's much just a little for strange, me. yeah. Um, but this dish has lots of fat from the vinaigrette. And, um, and then these capers are actually taken down a notch by doing exactly what we're doing. Okay. So we need those to sizzle a little bit more. And I'm going to reach down and adjust my heat on my oven. So those do their thing. We need that zest of that lemon to add to this. Are we putting that in the inside? Okay. So we actually drain these off and we let the oil cool. Mm -hmm. And then we add in our other ingredients okay. to, to make our salsa. So... Once we drain off those capers, what we're going to add into that oil are currants. So, do you have you heard of currants? I've heard of currant, but more in like the scent world of like candles and ah, things like that. So, I don't really know okay. about. Okay, interesting. It kind of looks like a raisin. Is it kind of in the raisin like, family? It, it is. It's a, it's a dried berry, and they're obviously very small. And I just find them a little more elegant than raisins. I don't mind raisins. Yeah. I like dried fruit and lots of things, but they're a little bit more elegant and they're definitely a different sweetness profile. So to me, a raisin has a very specific sweetness, like definition. Right. And when, to me, raisins just make a statement. Like I am a recipe that has raisins in it and <laughs> I'm pro raisin, like don't get me wrong. Um, but a current just to me has less of that overarching um, command on a recipe. Okay. So that's why, and currants are prolific in that part of the world. Right. So that's why they're using them. Using, so using that makes the sense. So these are actually going to soak in the hot oil, oil. and they'll also bloom okay. and get softer and do their thing. So we've got do you think our this is zest. zest. Is that enough? Let's check it out. Yeah, that is perfect. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little dish to get that zest in, okay. and then you are going to make the yogurt sauce. So there goes the zest, and that's not a bad smell. No, I love um, lemon. Yeah, so a zest of a lemon. I wrote a blog post about um, what teaching cooking classes here has taught me. Mm -hmm. And like, and you know how everything now is like five tips to you know, yeah, creating everything's the like a, yeah. three tips, seven tips. Yeah, yeah and, and everything's like and a And sometimes super it's quick six tip. or four. I like odd numbers. I actually think I did six. I can't remember. But yeah. one of the things that cook, teaching cooking classes here taught me is that we're going to need more lemons. Yes. We buy a sack of lemons every week. Oh, my gosh. And we use them all. They are just this thing that can instantly brighten something. It happened last night in the cocktails, curries, and cookies class. Mm -hmm. So we did a crawfish boil curry. We put all of the components of a crawfish boil in a curry. It was New so potatoes, good. <laughs> crawfish, corn. corn. And um, we def it's definitely a westernized version of curry. We did heavy cream to finish it off. And um, whatever, for whatever reason, whatever was going on with our vegetables, might have been going on with the crawfish, mm -hmm. just something wasn't right in the end, and we squeezed in Some lemon. a lemon. Well, think about it in crawfish boils, a lot of people yeah, put lemons and there's in crawfish lemons in crawfish boils. So, so yeah. we, didn't, we didn't steer from the theme. I was about to say, it, it was on theme, yeah. so it was, it was yeah. okay to put that lemon yeah. in there. Yeah, so really good. Okay. So you need a good pinch of salt in here. So this is unflavored, full-fat yogurt. I, this is Greek yogurt. You could use just full-fat yogurt, um, but definitely no low-fat or vanilla or anything like that. 
So she put a good pinch of salt in here, I'd say probably half a teaspoon. And then you are gonna squeeze in, we need a tablespoon of lemon. Okay. A lemon about this size, is good, and it's pretty squishy. I can tell it's juicy. This is gonna get you about two tablespoons of lemon. If you're super concerned, you can always measure it. Mm -hmm. But generally, a, a lemon that size, you're gonna get about two tablespoons. We need one tablespoon in the so yogurt. So we'll to do about a half. Yeah, we'll do we'll half, do and we'll, we'll save this for something else. So. <laughs> I was saying before that I wasn't sure how to use the So lemon how would squeezer. you have loaded that guy up? Well, normally I would just squeeze it and I use my hand. Right, and to just catch the seeds, catch and the that's seeds. totally fine. I, I thought it would be, you would put it face down like this. You act, you're right, yeah. And then squeeze it that way? So a lot of folks, no, that's wrong. That's oh. wrong. So it, it fits, so it totally fits okay. like that, right? right? That's wrong. So you actually want to go this way. The other way, okay. So you're... Pressing this. Because it seems like you would want it, like, because a regular lemon squeezer, you push the inside, you know, against it to squeeze the lemon out. So it right. seems like you would want it to squeeze that yeah. way. Yeah. But yeah. So we use this in cooking classes a lot. We have these, uh, a bunch of these, and pe folks love them. They, they really dig this tool. And 90% of the people put it in wrong. And then there's lemon juice flying everywhere, and someone's <laughs> going to get lemon in their eye, right. and then all the fun is over. <laughs> um, so it actually goes in like this. And as you're pushing this, you're going to invert that whole lemon. Okay, so it's going to yeah. okay, flip it and inside then out. And then this thing's going to catch the seeds. Gotcha. So um, go ahead and press that in. I've been working out just for this. There you go. Perfect, perfect. Ah, that makes so much more sense. Okay. <laughs> so all of that juice is out of there. Seeds are caught and all is good. So you're going to stir that and that's going to behave as if it's not going to want to come together and mm -hmm. it's going to almost, it might even look kind of curdly for a minute, right. but you're just going to keep stirring, 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 and it's going to incorporate it and it's going to make it super smooth mm -hmm. and it's going to take it down from that yogurt texture to just a little bit thinner. Right. Like kind of um, more of a sauce. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the base of the cauliflower that we're going to, um, oh, then we'll layer under, underneath the yep. cauliflower, like on the plate. Yep. So, we're making essentially a dip that you assemble on a platter. Mm -hmm. So if you think of seven layer dip with beans and then all the other things, kind of a similar thing where you, that base is the yogurt and then the cauliflower goes on top and then we do the salsa on top. over it. Sounds okay. Delicious. So I'm going to get these capers out into a bowl and we're going to move on to making this salsa. So here come the capers. So those smell divine. Yeah, they do smell good. They look larger because they- might be changing my mind on capers. Right, right. So they um, have plumped up and they're a little brown and they've uh, burst open. Right, I can see there's a split. all of that goodness is now in this oil in the pot where that we're going to use. That's perfect. That's that beautiful good? and smooth. All right. Make sure Josh gets that because we want to make sure we get to that <laughs> consistency. <laughs> That's what we want to use for the dip. Okay. So we're going to move on to creating the salsa. At this point, now that the capers have been sizzling and they burst and we can smell, what do you smell? I smell the vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. The, that, What's that capers. brininess? Right. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, if you notice that you don't have quite enough oil in there, you can always add more oil. Okay. But now we're going to start building this vinaigrette. So what I need you to do is add in the currants okay. and a tablespoon of crushed red pepper while okay. I get this parsley chopped. Very special service announcement on the cauliflower dish. You guys, it is not a tablespoon of red chili flakes, it is a teaspoon. We did consume it and kept our poker faces while we were tasting it with that tablespoon. It was hot, like my brow was sweating. Uh, Sarah loved it, but definitely I would err on the side of that teaspoon of chili flakes. We said a tablespoon, but it is definitely a teaspoon. And now back to our cauliflower roasting, already in progress. While I get this parsley chopped, and then you're gonna stir and the little bit of heat that's left over is going to help plump those currants. So we've got crushed red pepper going in. Do you know how to cut parsley? Chop parsley? 
There's no I, magic. I was about to say, if it's just you yeah. know, straightforward chopping, I think I can do it. So you just go over, push it back in a pile, go over it again, keep pushing it in a pile. Keep going. Yeah. And you like to leave in the stems as well? Or I did. Yeah. Um, for something like this, I do. Um, think it gives it a little bit of extra flavor? Yeah. Or? And this is a very young parsley. Mm -hmm. So the stems aren't offensive to me, gotcha. but yeah. All right, so we've got, ooh, that is so pretty. So we've got the currants in there, and now we need our walnuts, okay. lemon zest, and then the parsley is going to go in, and that is going to be our vinaigrette for our cauliflower. And then the walnuts, you kind of chopped a little bit, did a rough chop. So I chopped them, and I roasted them. You can okay. do it in a dry skillet on the stovetop or in the oven. And when you're roasting the walnuts, or really any nut, a lot of folks want to go into a high heat oven, get color on them, mm -hmm. and they certainly look like roasted nuts, but the you're meat the zest, sorry zest to goes in. Yes. The meat on the inside hasn't cooked yet, so you actually want to kind of go in a low oven. Okay. So I go a fairly moderate oven, like maybe 275, 300. It takes a little bit longer, um, but that way you know you've cooked the nut all the way from the inside out. And then we're also adding um, a tablespoon of the white balsamic. We need a vinegar. tablespoon of white balsamic. Okay. But come on. What? Yeah, that looks pretty. That is so gorgeous. Okay. So we're going to set that aside. And then we are going to take a peek at this cauliflower to see how we did. It's been roasting away. So that's where you want incredibly high heat. So I roasted at 450 degrees. The joke that I say is that 350 degrees is a bill of goods Betty Crocker sold us for cakes. <laughs> okay. And that many, many other things need to be at, at a, a high very, heat. very high yeah. heat. So we're at 450, and I think that was a really good idea because... And about how long do you think it takes These at were 15 minutes. Okay. And oh, wow. y'all... Come on. Yeah, I'm like looking at particular at this one that I want to eat. <laughs> Isn't that I love gorgeous? That crust. So take that your knife so and make sure we can easily pierce that cauliflower. Right, um, it could have a little bit of bite to it, but we want it to be. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. tender. Super tender. Okay. Looks good. So we need these to cool just for a minute. So I'm going to get you a platter because we're ready to assemble. Okay. So I need you to get that yogurt sauce. And spread kind of spread it out. Mm -hmm. You're going to make kind of like waves of yogurt sauce okay. so that then we can layer on the cauliflower there you go and usually yogurt they use yogurt in dishes when it's kind of a little spicy yeah it's kind when of, things are a little too that, spicy it helps bring that heat down yeah, it helps with the heat level for sure mm -hmm. oh and um i've got the naan in the oven oh, okay so because we want to have big pieces of naan to be able to dip this but that is gorgeous. I'm going to use all of, all of, all of it. All of it. All of Get it, it all I can on just there. Dump it all in there. Yeah. All right. There we go. So nice. And also the tanginess, all the different right. flavors. The and tanginess. The lemon in there mm -hmm. is going to be yep. really good with oh, everything. Good job. All right. Could you see yourself making this oh, for yeah, friends? Absolutely. Okay. So we've got I feel the like this would be like a really good kind of appetizer, too. Oh, for something sure. for everybody to share. Yeah. yeah. But with all that's going on here for ve um, vegetarians, mm -hmm. um, this is very, very um, solid, sustaining. Right. You know, um, lots of protein, mm -hmm. lots of good stuff going on here. Yeah, I think you could definitely have it as a full meal as well. For sure. Especially with the naan, kind of gives it a yeah. little, little bit of extra. All right. So let's get all this cauliflower on here. I love all the little kind of burnt crispies on the oh, side. Those well, are the best. I'm just being polite because <laughs> you're here, but normally, I was about to say, normally, normally I'd be no one those. knows those exist. Yeah. Um, I would be doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's all the goodness right there. All right, so are you ready to get that vinaigrette I over am the top? Ready. And I could see I was going to say I love the colors in the vinaigrette. It's gorgeous. It's like the green from the parsley, the red from the red pepper flakes. Yeah, the like nice the pop currants. from the red pepper flakes for sure. It looks really pretty. I love, yeah. I love when food has lots of different colors. Yeah. So we just kind of you know sprinkle what? it on. I say pour. Pour? I say just start, start pouring. I was going to try not, to make it look a little pretty. You're not going to leave any of that behind. All right. And if we... You could hit it with a little extra olive oil, a little drizzle of olive oil if you wanted to, oh or God. balsamic, but what? Yeah, this is ridiculous. So gorgeous. Oh, that looks so good. All right. I'm, look, I'm going <laughs> to grab some naan. If you would 
clear all of that, I'm yeah. going to grab some non and we're going to invite these folks who are behind the scenes to come and dig in with us. So nice warm non. Yummy cauliflower. We purchased non today, but we made non right. last night I know. And in I, our I was cocktails, kind of and cookies to know. class. Um, I, I felt like I heard you say it was just a few ingredients. Right. So it's, it was pretty simple to make. It was a yeast dough that did have an egg and yogurt in it. Okay. Um, which makes it super soft. Mm -hmm. But I made it earlier in the day. Um, it rose in a bowl. I punched it down. I cut it into 16 sections. How long did you have to leave it to rise? One hour. An hour? One hour. Cut it into 16, 16 sections, rolled it into balls, and then put it back. And by the time the class rolled around it had risen again mm -hmm. and um, super fun in a nice dry griddle pan over high heat we made homemade naan yeah last the, night. the class seemed to yeah. really enjoy it too they had a lot of people that were having fun with the dough yeah so here we are this is our ca roasted cauliflower with yogurt sauce oh, that looks so in good. that nice tangy spicy vinaigrette that goes on top and I guess it moved it away from us. Yeah. We should get a bite. Here, I'll move it back. I was going to say, do we need it? Here we come. That's a little hot. Let's see. I don't know if we needed this to help with the cauliflower. Maybe a spoon. All right. Make sure you get all of that. All in one bite. Mm. Is it good? I can't Stop get it. it on. So good. Oh my gosh. Tangy, a little bit spicy. Yogurt helps cool it off. Mm -hmm. Non helps as well. I like the crunchy from the walnuts. Really, really good. Very good. Job, good. Sarah. Thanks. This I mean, I know I did it all myself. Now all we have to do <laughs> is invite folks over. That's right. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening. <laughs> so if you're hesitating about cooking and getting folks together, just stop. Just do it already. Forget the perfectionism. Just get some things going, invite folks over. It is where so much magic happens. It's linked to longevity. It's linked to better health outcomes. It's linked to better mental health outcomes. It's fun. Come on, you guys. Just cook something, invite folks over, and gather. I love podcasts. I'm a podcast nerd, and I just came into this a little bit selfish of just wanting to do a podcast, and so much evolved as the season went by. We have helped folks. Folks have walked in with their devices, their phones and their tablets, asking, how do I listen to a podcast? What is a podcast? For me, that's just like, what? That's just such a mind-blowing thing for me. So this has been absolutely the beyond what I thought it was going to be like and to have too many ideas as I go into season two having to call down my ideas for season two is just so cool to me that we've gotten so much feedback and so much interest that now we have to sort of edit our list of what we're going to talk about on season two but I am super super excited about getting that going and talking more about all the delicious meals folks can cook and share together. Huge thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in, for telling your friends about it, for sharing about it on social media. How cool is that to see? And again, we absolutely love hearing from you all um, and would love, love, love to find out what you'd hear about and what you'd like to hear about in future seasons um, because we are here and ready and the mics are on um, and we would, we would love to talk about all the things that you want to hear. So you can connect with us through our website at redstickspice.com. Just for Smidgen listeners, we have a special discount code. Type in Smidgen15 for 15% 15 off your entire order. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those Red Stick Spice. Reach out to us in, on any of those places. Um, we are also smidgenpodcast.com, and you can listen, but you can also find us on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcast, Stitcher, and Spotify. So we have several folks we need to thank to for helping us get Smidgen off the ground. First of all, our producer is Catherine, and she's with Branch Out Programs, and she is the reason why we sound so good and have done so well this first season. So big, big thanks to Branch Out Programs. I also need to say thank you to Digital FX and Pixel Collective. First of all, Digital FX gave us our pretty cool digs where we record our podcast and also 
did lots of audio and visual support for us. Pixel Collective videotapes all of our episodes, and you can watch our podcast, who knew, watching a podcast on YouTube. So please be sure to head over and watch the cooking segments on YouTube. So thanks to all these guys for helping us get Smidgen off the ground, and we cannot wait for season two. Thanks, everyone. Bye.